reversed. Greetings, I'm Shad, and while I was at the Abbey Medieval Festival, I met some wonderful reenactors practicing the art of falconry, and I got to be able to pull them aside and talk to them a little bit about their craft. Before we get to dive into that, I'd like to just share with you a couple of little things about what falconry is. Falconry was sometimes called hawking, and this really depended if the primary birds being used were falcons or hawks. It is the art or sport in training birds of prey in the use of hunting, more often for sport hunting, but there are cases of falconry being employed for the purpose of finding food. This is because the sport of falconry was actually practiced by many social classes. Falconry, as described by Frederick II and other medieval writers, do classify it as an upper class sport. Some of the birds were costly and expensive to maintain, and their training did require time and skill. Yet falconry in its simpler forms, using local birds and less elaborate training methods, was practiced by other classes as well. As Frederick II wrote, the pursuit of falconry enables nobles and rulers worried by the cares of state to find relief in the pleasure of the chase. The poor, as well as less noble, by following this avocation, may earn some of the necessities of life, and both classes will find in bird life attractive manifestations of the processes of nature. Reading from the paper by Robin S. Oggins, The English Kings and Their Hawks, Falconry in Medieval England to the Time of Edward I. In England, all classes responded to the appeal of falconry. The English kings and nobility flew falcons, so did women and the clergy, despite church legislation to the contrary. By the 12th century, falconry had become a highly technical art with specialised vocabulary and an extensive literature. The birds were often imported from abroad. Gur falcons, peregrines, the goshawks from Scandinavia, sakers and lanners from the Mediterranean countries and sparrowhawks from Ireland. So indeed it was a very beloved practice and now let's hear a little bit more about this from these wonderful reenactors. And so, Mark, how long have you done this? 33 years. 30 well, oh, well, 33 years working with birds. Yeah. As for medieval events, mm -hmm. our ninth or eighth? It's our eighth time. Eighth. Eighth, eighth, eighth time. time. What's some of the biggest things that have stood out to you as you've learned this kind of art? Um, in regards to taking care of the birds in the modern day, but also the, the historical aspects. Well, the historical aspect has been the big part of it. Mm -hmm. And something I'm still blown away on is even back to the 14th century, which we are hoping we represent, what they knew back at a time when I would have assumed that they didn't know anything. <laughs> The detail! Yeah. Amazing! That's what blows me away so much whenever I learn more about the medieval period. It's how sophisticated and deep and intelligent these people were. When they had a craft or a trade, they worked to perfect it and they learned processes to improve it. And you find these levels of sophistication that honestly makes them feel smarter than us in the modern day because they actually are far more capable than they were. Well, and, and just how they simplify <laughs> exactly. things. Yeah. How, how, how we overthink things in a way, yeah, it blows me away regularly. Awesome. Yeah. So in regards to falconry specifically, what did they primarily use these birds for? All right. So um, there has been something of a myth in that there was an order as to who could keep what birds in the 14th century. It seems to have been a bit of a satire. Um, anybody was involved with falconry, but there were certain species that really were only accessible to people in a privileged position. Could I jump in just because you touched on something that resonates with me a lot, because that's exactly what I've learned. I've found that there's a lot of these factoids or things people hear, and then they apply it broadly over the entire medieval period. And what you've just said just makes sense. If someone loved birds and they could get a hold of the birds, what's stopping them from learning the craft and doing it themselves? You wouldn't have access to land. If, if you're ah. lower class, you've got no land to work with when yes. you're flying a bird. So there's no point in having it. And if you don't have the use or need for it either. I yeah, mean. for nobles, it was more of a sport. They, well, didn't, yes. they didn't really need the food. For upper the class, food. For upper class people, um, they do, would just stock up people's mm -hmm. lungs because they're big... so versatile goshawks. The big thing is the fact that you're feeding something that requires meat. Yes. Well, if you are barely affording to feed yourself, mm -hmm. you're not going to be feeding good. Yeah. As hunting goes, falconry is as hard as hunting gets. If you just want to get a pigeon, well, you just shoot or trap the pigeon. You don't feed a bird all yeah. week to get the pigeon. That's a very good point, yeah. Um, uh, so what you're saying is that hunting with a falcon is actually a more difficult time consuming process than trapping another easier method. Is that? Yes, yes, yes. But that said, 
There are smaller species. Mm -hmm. This thing will eat. This thing will live on grass. Mm -hmm. um, you could be trapping mice around your your home and feed this thing and go out hunting ducks. You could have a kestrel and be feeding it on uh, cockroaches, crickets, grasshoppers, and still go out catching sparrows mm -hmm. with it. But once you start getting to some bigger birds, say the peregrine falcon, for instance, everyone mm -hmm. thinks of the peregrine as being synonymous with falconry, and, and, and surely it is. But, a, but to utilize a peregrine, you've got to have access to land. Mm -hmm. and they were the elite. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you, not any oh Joe God, Bloke could walk across <laughs> someone's land and hunt those ducks that the Lord's been paying for his gamekeeper to feed, mm -hmm. they don't allow someone else to go and hunt them. So you, so there were some birds, but this was the bird that anyone could take advantage of. Yeah. And they don't need stamina. The peregrine falcon in this and needs fitness all week long. This is Not a peregrine, peregrine? No, this is a goshawk. Okay. You can put these in a cupboard for several days after a feed and forget about it. Yeah. 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 It is if a they're fat, beautiful they will bird. sit unstimulated yeah. for they're explosive of the glove, quick, I mean, short chase and something. A bit like greyhounds. Yeah. They're, they're very sleepy. Oh, like I, they're of birds. Genuine being this close, this is an absolutely gorgeous bird. Just the profile it has here in terms of its beak and head and the leaves, it's absolutely stunning. And it's interesting because I wonder if that had an influence as to why people in the appearance were attracted to them as animals and pets because they're just they're beautiful and they also have this kind of vicious streak, the hunting element to them. Uh, because we see, of course, animals like this and other ones adopted heraldry as well and things. So when you're saying like uh, the, the practice and interest, was it more like a really fancy pet versus an animal that had a practical utility to help them in hunting? There, there was the hunting side of it. It would depend on where you lived, of course, as well. Yeah. But I'm now led to believe that a lot of falconers gave, it, it gave falconers contact to people in higher positions mm -hmm. so you could be some drunk in a pub for, that as most of your friends would know you as but if you were a good falconer mm -hmm. you were getting things that your mates couldn't get mm -hmm. you probably got a you know a nice jacket because you're trained up who mm -hmm. was gospel or whatever it, it put falconers in a, in, a, in, a, in a quite a privileged position in, in many uh, communities if you could be a good falconer you, you had things coming your way and so what would be the standard duties of a falcon? So if they serve the Lord, would the Lord just say, I'd like to go for a hunt as kind of like an event, an uh, activity that they enjoyed, and the falconer would bring the birds? Yeah, well, for noble people, it was primarily entertainment. Entertainment? Um, showing off. Showing off, yeah. It, it's, it's very much a, a symbol of status. If you've got a peregrine falcon, you've got to be <laughs> quite high up in the hierarchy. Yeah, and, and, and I've no doubt too now that if anyone was employed to be a falconer, that person that was employing could afford to have a lot of birds. A falconer would be a busy person. Mm -hmm. and, and the land, depending on, on the land they had, um, there would have been some birds for game at certain times of year over something else. There wouldn't have just been a falcon or two. There'd be some goshawks. There'd be some, uh, say, we were, say we're in the UK, there'd be peregrine falcons, but there'd also be some um, gears or whatever they are that have been brought in from a northern country. And, and there, there was a lot of trading going on. Eagles apparently were only kept just to show off. They weren't utilized for hunting. 14th century Western Europe was mostly forest. There wasn't really much eagle. Perfect for goshawks. Perfect for goshawks. Um, but for the events, say like in this abbey now, an eagle, I've no doubt that in all big events, there was an eagle brought out just for the spectacle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in that spirit, let's do a quick segue to take a look at their wonderful eagle that they do bring out for this big event because it is such a wonderful spectacle. So, question. Yeah. Which breed of eagle is this? So this is the wedge-tailed eagle. Wedge-tailed eagle. This is the same genus mm -hmm. as the golden eagle that has been used for falconry through the Northern Hemisphere. Really? Yeah, so The golden eagle mm -hmm. is all around the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, so it's actually quite authentic to the type of eagle that so many yeah, eagle people... Yeah, ours have just got this dark long tail. It's really, really <laughs> wow, and, and so with falconry, did many did, did people actually have eagles as part of what... It, or... was, more in, it was more in Asian, mm -hmm. Eastern... Um, uh, speciality. Western Europe, I believe, until relatively recently, was just too forested mm -hmm. to be able to utilise them. 
but they were exchanged and as a novelty and they were were they were utilized in events like this mm -hmm. as a novelty that, that's what i was thinking because there are times where you see exotic animals appear in europe like lions kings would love to have a lion or something like that and so the rare occasion you might see an eagle yeah. just to show off because they this is an amazing, well, amazing... I've read that what would often happen is the eagle comes in from Eastern Europe or wherever mm. and with a falconer from that country. Ah, I see, yeah. Because, I mean, we see the eagle appear in heraldry quite often. I mean, one of the main things the Holy Roman Empire, uh, you know, in Germany, um, had the blazing eagle on there. And so, uh, and of course, what an amazing, amazing bird. And when you're saying that have multiple birds, uh, like what are we saying, five, ten? Oh, I, I, I assume, I'd assume sharing. way more than that. Yeah. yeah, I'd assume way more than that. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on the bird too. If you've got ten peregrines, that's going to take a lot more work mm -hmm. than ten goslings. Yes. Generally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Forgive me if this is a very uh, lame question, okay? Because I don't know much about birds. And so, what is the uh, classification of a falcon because it seems to be a lot of times it's simply a bird of prey um, or are there multiple breeds that can qualify as, as a falcon because obviously no. an eagle is a falcon. No, an eagle is actually the same genus as this. Really? Um, yeah, so all eagles are hawks, all true eagles yeah, are true <laughs> eagles are hawks, this is a hawk. Mm -hmm. Falcons are a different genus altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, historically in falconry terms anyway, referred to as long wings. Long They've all wings. got the general shape, same shape, they're built for speed, yeah. they're, they're the speed birds and generally working in open. Aubrey would be, if she was only flying a goshawk, would be an ostringer, ostringer, not a falconer, oh, or a okay. long winger with falcons. If you're, if you're flying hawks, and the same with eagles. Okay, so they actually ostringer. did change the name yeah, yeah, based on the species yeah. of bird. Oh, and, so. I, and I would, I, I'm confident in saying that you would have certain regions where there were always only ostringers, mm -hmm. and then there were other regions where there was a mix of ostringers and falcons because they had say more open air. Well, that's very interesting. So, because whenever people think of the craft of uh, medieval birds of prey and stuff, it's always falconry. There's actually another term for a different type yeah, of bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, what was it? It was ostringer. Ostringer. I ostringer. These are the facts I love. These are just little things like that because, again, it, it, we hear something again. If we don't have enough of the context, we just kind of apply it broadly. And my kind of understanding before talking to you is such a falconry was the word used to talk about, you know, uh, the, the practice of having medieval birds of prey and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's actually more expensive, which is really interesting. The yeah. scientific name for the goshawks that would have been used in uh, medieval England, which is what we're trying to replicate. Uh, northern goshawks. They're much bigger. Their scientific name, I believe, originates, um, it actually means um, gentle hawk. Mm -hmm. Gentleman's hawk. No, 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 gentle hawk. I'll shut up. <laughs> I'll, sh I'll shut up. A sipiter gentilis, so gentle, which is odd considering <laughs> what they are. I just want to comment because this, this bird has been chowing down on that bit of meat. What have you been feeding? Is that like a quail chicken? leg? Quail leg. So uh, smaller well, goshawks tend to go for birds, I believe, mm -hmm. and the larger go for mammals. Uh, like and what's this one's name? Fergus. Fergus, because Fergus is ripping, he's loving that, and he is just ripping into it. How's the face on it? Yeah, I know. They're, they're, like I said, they're, they're a bit of an entrancing animal when you're up close to them, and I can really see why people re enjoy them. It's a really interesting thing, because the higher you were up in the medieval period, gave expanded options for certain types of exotic pets in these cases yeah. of royalty having yeah, yeah, yeah. lions and stuff in, in, and, and everything and so this is just an interesting example that it's a bit exotic it's a harder for the regular person to get a hold of but yeah it, before you could get to lions and everything like that it was a, almost a mid-ground of a really entrancing kind of exotic royal looking kind of animal Really uh, they were they were frequently kept indoors because a lot of noble people would have spent a lot of time indoors. Mm. There are, I'm sure, there are um, artworks and illustrations of uh, just birds sitting around tables and stuff mm. inside. I'm really glad he's a part of this because these brown goshawks are generally not appreciated by people. Really? They take um, people's pet birds and poultry all the time, <laughs> yeah, and so they they're pretty loathed.
Because I can understand you don't want your family pet eaten by one of these things, but yeah. also it's a bird of prey. That's, That's what they do. Yeah. And, and um, people would just shoot them. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't. these birds don't understand the confines of an enclosure. They're just going to be... Uh, they often hang around uh, chook pens in hope of a feed and just perish because they can't get in. Yeah, yeah. So... Is this, what's the, what, where does this bird originate from? Uh, it's not native to Australia, I'm assuming. Yeah, brown goshawks are native. Native to Australia? Yeah, really? uh, there are 13 subspecies and they're in the, um, many Pacific Islands. I believe we have three subspecies, or at least that we know of. There's, they're probably interbred all over the place. And um, so... Is this a, like, what's what's the closest equivalent of this bird to the European one that they might have had in the middle? The northern goshawk. Northern goshawk. Much heftier bird. Really? Yeah. And so this one is a goshawk, but it's, mm -hmm. it's just a regular goshawk versus a northern goshawk. Northern goshawks are the only goshawks found in the majority of Europe and um, US. Yeah. They're the only ones in the US. And is this the type of um, uh, bird that uh, nobility would go for? But you say there was, a, there was a more prestigious one. Uh, Peregrine falcon was the elite. The elite, and that is a European bird? Oh, they're all over the, the globe. globe. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, goshawks were, they were sought after, and a part of it, <laughs> I've, I've read both that the northern goshawk scientific name is nobleman's hawk and gentle hawk so whether that's yeah. kind of evolved somewhere uh, it sounds like that, that would have come oh from... get that yeah look at that yeah that's <laughs> nice that's a sign of comfort really yeah i agree i think that terminology it sounds very likely that it comes from the fact that yeah. you know, nobility would have um, uh, enjoyed having these birds as pets odd to be called gentle hawk yeah they're, 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 it's so odd <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, That's uh, guys, oh, you're letting, welcome. For letting welcome. us interview and uh, letting us learn a bit more about falconry and seeing one up close has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. And I also appreciate you guys. Thank you for watching. Uh, this is, we've been here at the Abbey Medieval Festival and it was, sorry, Mark, Mark and Aubrey. Aubrey. Thank you very much for watching and of course hope to see you on the next video here on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell. Thank you to everyone who's come to watch this video. It really means the world. But unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are not getting notified of my content. YouTube is currently deranking and suppressing content like mine to, in preference to other content. And a lot of my viewers and subscribers are not actually getting notified. One of the ways in which is actually a truly a tremendous help in trying to break through this type of suppression is by subscribing. If you enjoy the content, please do subscribe and join us in the future. Liking and commenting helps boost the interactions on the video, which makes the algorithm realize that more people are engaged and of course sharing is absolutely really crucial to help everyone know that yes this video exists and letting the people know who want to watch this content that it's actually made and it's released ringing the bell only does so much to try and get notifications youtube has actually not been notifying people who have even the bell rung and so if you really want to ensure that you get notified when i upload you can follow me on facebook or twitter i announce when i upload on those platforms and the ultimate way to make sure you never miss a an upload and get the notification is by subscribing on my website we will send out emails notifications to those people who are signed up on the website there will also be special announcement and even potential bonus content for those people who subscribe on the website for everyone who's doing that thank you so much it means the world and especially those people who are going even the extra step and supporting me through the donation platforms currently the primary ones have been Subscribestar and patreon but there's a new one that is brilliant called utrian utrian is a video hosting platform that also does donation style subscriptions like the memberships on youtube currently but it's also a great video hosting platform and truly if every one of my active viewers were able to donate between one to five dollars a month that would give me complete security and less reliant on the ad revenue system which gives me options to pursue and try and support many alternative platforms because unfortunately youtube is caring less and less about content creators who are making content like me i'm not the only one in this boat so please do support the creators that you want to ensure that they can keep making content and that you get the content that you want to see Genuinely thank you to everyone who's supporting in any way possible. It means the world. And thank you very much for having watched this video. Hope to see you on the next one.